The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is brought to you by NetWealth, market-leading providers of technology, excellent customer support and expertise to help your wealth business thrive. Rated number one for overall satisfaction and value for money by Investment Trends and Chant West's Advised Product of the Year for the last four years, NetWealth is here to support you on your advice technology journey. See wealth differently and visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and joining me here today to deep dive into the iFactFind software is a university lecturer, a fellow financial advisor, a doctor of business administration, financial planning and services and a tech development survivor, which is completely impressive. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Paul Moran. Woo! <laughs> Thank welcome, you for having welcome. me, Peter. Thanks for having me, Peter. It's great to be here. Not at all. Suddenly, I'm feeling particularly undereducated. I've no. got to say. <laughs> no, look, I'm just a. I, I just. It's my hobby, you know. So, so I keep. I just keep going with it. I've finished it now, but that's great. Oh well, look. I think. Um. I actually, I know that you're our first doctorate on oh, the podcast. So welcome. We'll all be smarter for the uh, episode, which is fantastic. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so look, I'm really keen to dive into iFact Find, but first let's just take a moment to get to know you through your use of sure. technology. Now tell me, what's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? You know what? I'm a huge ellipsis user, you know, really the three dots. It's in almost everything I send has got three dots in it. So <laughs> rather than the emoji, there's always the eye wink emoji, but but really the ellipsis is not really an emoji, but it's a thing that goes into almost everything I send. You know, so <laughs> I love it. I, yeah. So I, I keep getting it. corrected by, you know, Grammarly, but I overcome that. So You know what? It's something I use a lot too. I've just realized that's something that I've, it just feels necessary. There's a pause required, that's right. right? That's right. Yep. <laughs> I love it. Now, if you had to delete all but three apps off your smartphone, which ones would you keep? Right. Well, I'd keep LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, so I like LinkedIn a lot. Um, I would keep Google because that's the obvious one to have. Mm -hmm. And I like what three words. <laughs> what, what, three words what three words is an app that emergency services can use um, to identify any person in the world within 10 square meters by using three words that the app generates. So it plugs into each other. So any any there's a combination of three words that will locate you on the planet within ten square meters. So I just find that's fascinating. So. Wow. <laughs> I mean, in a, in, a, in a previous life, I was an ambulance paramedic for about a decade back, okay. back in the eighties, early nineties, and so I understand the importance of being able to locate yourself and know where you are. Yes. So I think it's a I think it's a terrific app. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. We'll all have to go away and check that out too. I love it. I love it. <laughs> well, let's dive into iFactFind, shall yeah. we? Yeah. So let's go a bit broad. Help me get a sense of where it sits in the advice tech space. What category does it sort of generally fall under? It's a, it's a, it's a fact find, right? That's what we named it iFactFind because everyone knows exactly what it is. We, <laughs> we, when we started this development program about four and a half years ago, okay. it struck us, you know, we were looking at tech, you know, broadly, what do we need to do and do we want to build ourselves? And we kind of realized pretty early on that that everything we do, everything we do is based on client information. Mm. And yet the majority of advisors still hand clients a piece of paper and say, fill it in. So we spend all this money on tech. Clients never see it. They think we're they think we're, think we're binary. And so so <laughs> it's, it sits in the in the space as a as a very comprehensive digital fact find. We're not we're not trying to place it as 
give us three answers, three questions, and we'll give you a product. It's, it's around right. a permanently live tool that clients can update on as on, as they go basis, and advisors can update as information reveals itself. I, I know, we know we know clients' information reveals itself over time. They don't yeah. give you all the information in one hit. All right. So if you do a paper based fact find or a static pa- fact, fact find, that information has to go somewhere else. Yeah, you know, you don't update the fact find; it goes into a file note or in your head or something like that. So we want a, a document process that was permanent and live all the time. Okay. And we, we bolt, bolted in um, pretty early on a fairly comprehensive scoping program, scoping tool yep. as well, and goal setting. So it sits in that, um, the first review. two meetings with the clients, yeah, and then, yeah, and then okay. the review process gets updated from time you know, as the clients come for review. Okay. So what was the trigger though? So what caused you to go, I really need to build a digital fact find? Like there must have been something that made you do it, right? It was. It was starting off by saying we wanted to build an X-plane. Okay. And realizing, oh, oh my. <laughs> and realizing after about six months that was the stupidest idea we could ever possibly have. <laughs> but that really led us to this idea that, but hang on, how do we get the client, how do we get the data into the into X plan, right? Or wherever that, whatever you happen to be using at the time. And and that is that is like I get a paper based form filled out, half filled out, twenty five percent filled out. I spend time filling in the rest of it. Then I physically transfer and manually put the art information in. So we wanted something that was more interactive. Now, certainly. Um, the lockdowns were Melbourne-based, um, and the lockdowns in Melbourne, you know, world capital lockdowns, mm. really can do something because it's really usable in, in a Zoom or a Skype or, or a Teams meeting because the data is updated as you go. So advisors and clients can be logged in at the same time, seeing what's being updated. Um, and so Fantastic. they can work, work through and get the, that fleshed out information much easier. Okay. And so – in terms of so clearly the primary user or the the initial focus was the advisor, right? So the person interacting with the client. I'm betting though there's some secondary users there, right? That I mean, we we the- built this from day one to be interactive with between clients and advisor. So we built the client portal when we built iFactFind at the start. Yeah. So it's designed for the client actually for the clients to log in and fill that. The advisor obviously initiated the advisor creates yeah. the creates the client. Um, although we're moving towards having that done automatically, but but. Um, but the clients are created by the by the advisor, and then they send the fact find to them, or they send the mini fact find the first up, and then before the meeting, and then after the meeting, then the, the more detailed fact find. Okay, and how are you finding in terms of um, the way teams are using it? For, well, let's talk licensees. So, is, is this something you're finding whole licensees are taking on, or is it more you know practice by practice that people take on the tool? I mean, licensees without without trying to bag the licensees, there's certain areas in the license group starting with the word compliance that are very <laughs> averse to wanting to try new technology yeah because they they're so bogged down with what they do that they think anything new is too difficult yeah so we get it from the ground up it's more it's more organic with we're, we're advisors within within the license so i want to use this and it works backwards we have having said that there are certain certainly some some progressive licensees out there who have approached us and said we want to use it um, and and talk to us about it. Now, can we maybe um, get it to work for us specifically? Yeah, um, okay. So it's but it, it is it is pretty organic, I'd say. And that's um, I'm I'm starting to see that in the interviews we're doing is that sort of things fall into two camps. It's either sort of an automatic yes type of tool because it's been around a long time, or as you know that sort of thing, or it requires the practice or the, even the individual advisor to give it a whirl, to test it, to get comfortable with it and then pitch it if they need to. Yeah, you get, uh, you get your champions in, in, in the licensees who, who love yeah. it and want and want everyone to use it, which is great for us. Uh, and then we just got to try and backfill and yep. go through, through the appropriate channels to get them to sign off on it. And, it, and as I say, there's some very progressive licensees and there's some very reductive licensees. So. And look, I think um, – you know what's what's happened with our industry, and it happens um, with any, but particularly in financial services, where legacy of things holds us back. You know, it could be a legacy of a, a you know a system within a product provider that can hold them back, or a, a legacy of a process. Like this legacy word is the is personally one of my most hated words because it just holds us back, doesn't it? And so I I think over time, particularly with the transition of the number of advisors where everybody's going. My hope for everybody out there is that um, the licensees will start to adjust a bit more to tech so that it'll be sure I get that they've got to assess it. Um, but I think particularly, you know, a tool like this, it's a particularly um, singular focus, if you know what I mean. So they're not having to assess lots of things. No. You know, it's doing a particular job. Yeah, it's not giving advice. No. You know, it's just capturing the data. And we capture the data very materially better than the paper-based fact find. 
uh, yep. in a much more compliant manner. We, we have an audit log, for example, that's built in. So every interaction, every piece of data that's added, added, ended, end, edited, amended, or deleted is recorded. And we have a perpetual audit log of everything that's happened. So compliance teams look at that and go, that's pretty good. We know who, who did, we know who did the risk profile. We know who did yep. the scope questions and all sort of stuff. So that's, that's pretty good to do. But, but also legacy has this, another, element which is which is some of the original software um is very very closed right you know it's very ring fenced yep. and you can't get in or out of it it's very difficult you know and we pick yeah. on the obvious one we always pick on x plan the obvious one and we integrate with x plan but it's a challenge sure you know it's a challenge because for example x plan don't have an open api architecture sure. they have a closed api architecture and their apis don't map to their own sites so we have to remap every single site that uses X Plan, um, okay. which we do, but but yeah. that that is, as as a dominant player, um, it's hard to get stuff out of there. We've designed our system to have data be able to point anywhere, right? Uh, so you can you can have access whenever you want it to, to get it. It's not it's not locked into something. Something I feel like we probably need to cover, given um, the headlines that have been going on with. Um, telecom hack that went yeah. to, that occurred. Um, I feel like I now need to, with everything, we all do actually, get far more aware of this anyway, but talk to me about cybersecurity. Talk to me about how that works from both the client's perspective and the advisor's perspective. Yeah. So, so from the very start, we have what, what we call two-factor verification as well as two-factor authentication. Okay. So clients and all users, that's, that's, uh, that's advisors and their support staff as well as end clients, um, verify themselves with a, with a verifying their email and a mobile phone number with an SMS code as a starting point. Then every time they log in, they log in with a two-factor authentication, as you would normally expect to. Separately, that we, our, our host, our cloud host is AWS, Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, we feel that they are the most secure uh, of yeah. the cloud hosting services. Um, and we have a number of different different uh, buckets with holding data in different buckets. So so that would technically mean you would have to hack an encryption in, in at least two buckets simultaneously in Amazon yeah. To be able to map the client information with with the other information and put it okay. together, so it would be pretty. It would be pretty Difficult given that everything's encrypted, this. encrypted, and we double yeah. encrypt uh, sensitive information like TFNs and SRNs and HINs and CRNs. Okay. We double encrypt and require a specific pin to access um, them. Okay. So we think we think we're pretty secure. Okay, um, good. But I'm going to you know, hand on heart. Right. Who knows and- these days? But but uh, <laughs> but but you know we've done everything we possibly can. Um, to focus on security. I think this is one of those things that we're all going to need to get used to. It's layers of protection, isn't it? There isn't just a lock <laughs> protected. Yeah. Yeah. It's layers of it. What are the multiple things you can do? Yeah. You know? I mean, two, um, two-factor, two-factor authentication, for example, there are some clients who just hate that. Yeah. Um, so at a client level, we have an ability for, a cl- for an advisor to turn off two-factor authentication for a specific client if they have a lot of trouble with it. Um, but the administrator of the practice is the only one who can turn off two-factor authentication for the advisors and the clients across okay. the board. Yeah. And look, I think given what's just happened and given the impact we've seen, um, I think that's a conversation that you could – nudge a client and just say, this is for your benefit. Like this is protecting you. And we all just need to get a bit more used to that, don't we? Like it's, this is, this is a good thing. I know it's a bit, you know, it's, an, it's a little hindrance, but it truly is a little one. Like once you're set it, up, it really you know, is. it's, and it's and not the, that the big element a deal. of security is we have the secure document vault built in. So we've tried to avoid where possible emailing information backwards and forwards. Yep. Um, so the document vault was again, the first thing we put into it. So the clients can log in and update um, add documents like driver's licenses, statements, trust deeds. Um, advisors can, can load in advice documents, which the clients can have access to if they want to, rather okay. than like backwards and forwards. Even our e-signature process, you know, with something like something like a health, like a DocuSign or, or Adobe Sign, when when you send a document that way, um, you send the document as a PDF, right? Okay, which kind of defeats the purpose of all the security that goes around it. So, in our e-signature process, which is our own own one. We send a link, which the right. client logs into to a website to access it to sign, e-sign there, rather than emailing backwards and forwards. Just little things like that. So that's something that probably people might not have expected when they're sort of looking at the tool. Is it's 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 really not. It's not like a, oh, this will you know replace Survey Monkey for your risk profile. So I thought this is a portal, even if it's portal for a specific thing. Like it, but it's still got portal characteristics. So so that's that's another another sort of 
unknown benefit. I have to admit, I wasn't as aware of until I did that digging. Was oh, okay, this is actually a portal. This could be something that's your, you know, play. It's the little place that's the hub between you and yeah. the client. And, and, um, and we'll talk later about where we're going, but that's where we're going with the portal. So we'll eventually get the all the bank feeds will come in in, in uh, first half of second, second next year. Um, so all the bank feeds data feeds will come in. So it will become a it will become a real hub for clients to look at. But you know, something like a Survey Monkey, which I, I totally get, or, you know, a, a cognitive form or something like that. But it's still it's still an equivalent of a paper based form. Yeah. It's a little bit of formatting in it, but but it's done once and finished. Yes. So we're trying to move away from that to the idea that as client's information becomes available to you over sometimes a couple of years. Well, um, and that's you know. that's actually something I wanted to talk about because um, as somebody who's, you know, been in, in and out of a lot of CRMs for the business, like looked at a lot of this stuff, the single thing that's the hardest to achieve is time series of data. Right. So, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here, so I apologize in advance, but how, how are you guys placed for that in terms of that seeing the picture over time? Um, given that it's, if you can use it for review, does that then give you the opportunity to sort of give a client a picture of something that's over time and how they've improved, for example? Yeah. So not, not as yet, but it's certainly okay. where we're going. That the issue we have, um, Look, we're well aware of time series data and well aware mm. of using a, a, a historical time series as well as future time series. And one of the weaknesses of most modeling software, it's always future looking. Yeah. It doesn't incorporate <laughs> backward looking. So we're no. building that, we're building that out. But, um, but we do take a, we do take a snapshot, what we call a snapshot. Every time advice is given, the clients e-sign the data at that point in time. And so we yeah. take a, 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 effectively we take a PDF of okay. all the data at that point in time and we store it with a code in it so that, so the client it can be re- referred to in the SOA, ROA. If they still exist in a couple of years' time, um, but but uh, that means that we, you know, you can see the the, the fact find completed today versus the fact find completed a year ago. So there's no graphic representation yet, sure. but you can at least see the data changes in that, in that period yeah. of time. Okay, you, that's that's perfect. I mean, and, and I and I knew I was being cheeky asking because it's just it's the um it's the unicorn of you know, we're, we're financial that, we're, information, right? We're, we're well that unicorn. We're chasing yes. that unicorn right now. So <laughs> perfect. Now talk to me about. There's going to be some practices that you'll find just really take to this, and others that have struggled. Who does it really work for? Who who find it a bit tough? It works. It works well for clients, for advisors who are happy to sit down with the clients and start this process. Right. Okay. So they go through that. You know, our, our typical workflow is the the pre meeting questionnaire. We call a pre meeting questionnaire or mini fact find goes out beforehand. And that's all done. That's all completed on phone, tablet, or, or PC. Mm-hmm. It takes about five or seven minutes. It's it's uh, pretty easy. The document vault starts there, so you can use your phone, take photographs of things, and load it straight in. Um, but it gives enough information for the advisor to start some basic modeling if they wanted to. Okay. But that's not the fact find. So, you know, we ask how much super have you got? Nothing about the super. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what's your mortgage? Nothing about the mortgage. Um, so, so when we go to the fact find, it's another level of, of, of information. And, mm-hmm. um, the expectation, we've got some practices who, who think they just want to be able to send it out and have it completed. <laughs> and, and that's, that is the equivalent of, of sending them a 40 page fact find in the mail saying filled in and tell me when you're finished. It just doesn't happen. No. It just doesn't happen no matter what age you are. So we just think in the meeting with the client, the ones who do best, sit down with them and in the last 10 or 15 minutes of the meeting, open the fact find, which is already there, just open it and just start filling the first few screens and the clients right. get an orient- orientated to it. When we send, when they release the fact find, it's a workflow that goes to the client in, in an email. Um, there's a video embedded in that um, and a link to take them to the, to the fact find. Because what the client sees on their screen is exactly what the advisor sees on their screen. So when the okay. advisor starts sending the information, they're identical screens. Okay. They'll see exactly the same thing. So it doesn't work as well when advisors think this should be just an automatic thing. You know, right. I don't want to, I want a hands off, you know, where I just, I don't want to touch the client until they're ready to sign up and, and, and there's the SOA. And that, that doesn't yeah. work for that because that's not what we're after. Well, then I look, t- to be frank, I've I've never had somebody able to do that because they don't have that sort of A, information on hand, but also B, they don't think in that sort of detail. Like the questions we're asking are often things that they've never had to actually cogitate on. Right? It's not- even, even the scope, right, the scoping tool. You know, right. we, we, what we say is initially we, we put the scoping questions into the mini fact find, but we understand that's what the clients think they want to talk about. That's yeah. not the scope. <laughs> scope yeah. can only be determined when you've had a discussion with the clients at the end of the fact find. To work out when you've been through everything, we talked about estate planning, you've talked about insurances, you've talked about their debt, you've talked about the superannuation and their assets and cash flow. Then you can work out what's going to be in the scope, and you finalise it at that point. You you, conf- you confirm it with the client. So yeah. I think it's 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 um it, it's when when you take the time to get that information, and I think it's it's 
you know, I often a kid, liken it to when you go to a doctor. You know, if you go to see a doctor and and they basically say fill in this form and give it to me, that you know, when you get it, to, it just goes into a file, it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. But someone who actually asks all the questions, you yeah. feel much more comfortable. You feel a lot more uh, trusting of that of that person. You feel a lot yeah. more uh, comfortable with the with the advice they're going to give you. Yeah. So I think it is an interactive thing. It's when it yeah. works best. And is it the sort of thing that a client could um, get partway through, stop, go away, you know, have a few days and then come back? So it is something that they – it's not like they've got to sit until they're finished. No, no, it's a portal. <laughs> so. It just saves – it auto saves every screen. Every screen auto yeah, okay. saves. So they can stop whenever they want, start whenever they want. We track okay. progress. We track on our main dashboard uh, level of completion, the day since last login, last login day. Um, so so you can see if someone's stalled somewhere, you can see where they're at. But it's, it is totally designed to be able to go in and out of as often if you want to. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And I'm betting that, you know, the if you really got organised, then you could even have, you know, an admin team member sort of watching for those stalled ones and either giving them a quick buzz or yeah. dropping them an email, something just to give them a nudge. Go, oh, do you need some help? Do you you're like using it that way to keep the flow happening, you know, without sort of pushing too hard, I think, because everybody gets busy. We get distracted. Yes, so- and, we, and, we, and we are building out some automated emails that will go out to clients as refreshes. So if it's been five days since you've last logged in, uh, will there be an email going out to you to say, hey, you know, it's been a few days. Do you want to jump it back on the door or do you want to click this button to contact your advisor for some help? There's an advisor click buttons all the way through for help. Um, yeah, okay. Contact Perfect. your advisor if you need to. Yeah, because I do think um, we did an assessment. It was a couple of months ago and it caused us to go down a path with some new tech. And, and um, I worked out that more than half of all the tasks that all the team were set were Follow up client on, <laughs> and and I was okay. This is I'm. I mean, we should be following up. I don't have an issue with that, but clearly there's a nudge problem here. You know, like there's this problem with us having to manually do that. And so the more that something can do that for us, at least to a point, you know, where okay, I'm just going to call them. This has got you know. Do you want to have a time? Let's just do it. You know, let's just finish this off. So, yeah. and sometimes so, yeah. it's. I mean, we we identified. Um, you know, there's compulsory fields all through the fact find. Right, and it's a sequential fact find database. So you start top and work from top to bottom. Yep. That way, we only run information cascades down the line. So we're only yep. entering it once. But we know that there's some information. For example, um, for example, what's the who's the beneficial owner of a trust? Right. We kind of know most clients go what. <laughs> the who's he what? <laughs> yeah. So even though it's compulsory, we've built this little thing called a missing link, which means you can click a little button there to say, "I'll come back to this later on." It doesn't okay. stop you from going through, and you can keep working way through. And builds a little to do list off to the side that, that you've got to come back to before the fact finds finished. So we're trying to minimize, um, I mean, we're, we're about to launch a new big big kind of look, um, which will remove about 40% of clicks from the fact find. Nice. We're just making it a, a lot more intuitive to work, work through. Yeah. That, like any software, it goes, it develops itself, you know, it goes off on a tangent. And every now you're going to stop saying, you know, what's, it was good, you know, but we've done all this other stuff now and it's 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 probably 50% bigger than it was two years ago. Right. So maybe we need to refresh how that looks. And so we've been through that project now. We're about to launch that in the next couple of weeks. And I think it's something that probably in finance generally, you know, not just financial advice, we don't acknowledge enough that the way we think and what is logical to us is almost guaranteed to not be the way yeah. it is for the consumer. I remember um, I've got a good friend of mine and and they're actually in marketing, they're very visual. And I looked at their phone and they've got their apps on their phone sorted by color. So when they scroll, it's all the green apps on this page and all the red, like, and like to me, that is absolute insanity, yeah. right? But to them, <laughs> yeah. it's the it's the most intuitive and obvious thing you'd ever do, you know? And so I think that's the other challenge we have with these tools until we get clients to start using them is we realize, oh, yeah, we shouldn't have asked that then. Like to us, that seems obvious as the next thing, but it's not to them. No, but there's, there's a lot of questions we do ask that we think aren't asked. So little things like, like I use this example, I've got, I've got a client who's been a client for over 20 years and they've always talked about their son. Mm-hmm. And their son's 51 years old, right? right? But they've always talked about their son, their son Andrew, right? And so Andrew, bless Andrew, that blah, blah, blah. So we've gone through and we've we've done state planning, we've done all sorts of stuff. And, and, and then in, in our fact find, we ask the question, okay, put a child in, Andrew, whose child is it? Okay, the two folks, is a client, right. a partner or both? And they tick client, not partner. And I said, oh, but you haven't ticked. No, no, this he's my son, not her son. Wow. It's 20 years later, right? Yeah, <laughs> So absolutely. because it's not a question that gets asked. 
No. But we can ask it here because it's a simple checkbox to answer. So yeah. we get into sort of that level of what I call intimate data. And at every section, every line of the fact find, every section has a little micro note section built in. So if you're in children dependence and you want to make some notes, there's a file note system in there built in for children dependence. If you want to put in for entities, there's a little mini micro note for, for children dependence. And that's where you'd put in stuff that wouldn't wouldn't normally fit in, the, in anywhere else it'll you know like the kids yep. got, a, got a disability and it's going to need extra help or yep. you know they hate the entity it doesn't like they don't like the sms if you put that sort of stuff into that micro note section and the micro notes are also visible by the client or no. just by the advisor uh, the, advi- the the client has a v- section and the advisor has a section so in the okay. cl- advisor can see the client notes client can't see the advisor notes okay nice and i and i like that flow i do think um look file notes are the bane of everybody they're absolutely necessary and to to be frank fundamental even just for handover internally right so let's but you're right a stream of consciousness in a note is nowhere near as valuable as something right next to the thing it's talking about. Correct, <laughs> so. correct. And it's updatable, so therefore it's always current, you know. Okay. And so we have a we have a file note system built into IFAC Find. It's a very good file note system, but we totally get – everyone's also using uh, financial planning software and, and, and a CRM, and there's probably file notes in there as well. But yeah. we had enough clients who weren't using any of those to have their own file note system in, in, in here. Unfortunately, XPlan don't offer an API for file notes uh, work sort of do so we have a work sort of integration with file notes for them but not not with xplant at this point so and look i think um there's always ways to adjust for that you know yeah, so yeah. it's it's it depends if that particular feature gets value for somebody then they find a workaround they find a way to to handle that you know um i think we've i think the full integration stuff is awesome but it You've, you've got, I call it human API. If it requires just a little bit of a save as a PDF and put in the, you know, yep. record or whatever, then it, if it still makes it easier for you and makes it a better result, well, then so be it. You know, that's okay. Let's, since we were talking about integration, let's dive into that and then we'll come back to the sort of client experience. So I could, I was so excited on the website when I saw that you're into a great with Zapier. How did that process go? Well, it's just it's early days for us. We've got about yep. six six things that we we inter, inter, interact with on Zapier. Um, mm-hmm. It's it, but just it gives us the flexibility, to put some little little functionality into it. So yep. so zapping into say Outlook, for example. Yep. Um, so 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 it just means that we we're trying to, you know, ideally we want a good properly proper integration built. Sure. So Zapier is a short term fix, you know, yep. uh, for for little bits of information to go across from point A to point B. But we're registered with Zapier. That's that's the first process, as you know, and so therefore we can keep up updating that with the first few out there. Yeah. But we do we do link with Zapier, but it's not it's not our primary source of integration. Yeah. So we pre- and prefer I think, to use APIs. Yeah. And I think for a listener that doesn't know what that is, look, Zapier is just one of many, but it's a tool that really connects anything to anything, anything that's on their list, it'll connect. And But we always think it's data, right? We always focus on the data connection, but some of the best things we have in those connections is a trigger. Something happens in A causes something else to happen in B, you know, so sometimes just as simple as that can be enough um, to just save a bit of time, you know. Um, so, so yeah, I was excited to see that only because to me it demonstrated a willingness to want to integrate, you know, like it's, yeah, we get it, you know, we can't do it for everything. We'll do it for the big ones um, that you've mentioned. So you mentioned work sorted. I'm assuming X plan, so you've gone through that pl- process. Yep, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. What else? Uh, fin- what else? Fin365 have just finished, so okay. that's integrated now. We'll probably work on um, – we've been – this new project to, to minimize the clicks has been the main focus of development for the last couple of months. Mm-hmm. Um, next, The next focus will be moving to a platform called React. Um, Re- React is a platform that um, – you know, when we started off, IFAC Fine was this big, and yeah. now it's a lot bigger. And yeah. so a new platform gives us a lot more flexibility around around uh, mobile phone, uh, tablet, uh, multi, multi-tool multi integrations, sort of – Right. Which which much better and uh, but that'll be uh, uh, next couple of months coming up. Yep, yep. Uh, and then we'll move on to start more integrations. We have an open A. Well, it's not it's not published, but we have an open API architecture. Okay, we have about five thousand data points um, that we can integrate with if we need to. Um, we'll, we'll probably work with the ones who are have also have open API. So, for example, Midwinter might be coming up soon. We will yep. work with Voyant. We're working with Voyant pretty closely at the moment. We're talking to them in the US pretty regularly. Yep. So Voyant will be our next our next integration. Yep. Um, Voyant's great software, but it's a bit clumsy to enter the data, which okay. is perfect perfect for us. Yes. So the data yes. can be entered automatically. It becomes a really, really good, good, useful tool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and so probably probably then midwinter after that, and then we'll see where we go after that. Yeah. And look, I think um, it's something that I, I think lots of users just don't ever realize, but the more they'd simply let people like yourself or, you know, other tools know what would be helpful, 
the more you can get a sense of what should be on your development path. I think yeah. people sort of stay a bit quiet and it's like, no, no, no. If you think of something, it doesn't mean you're saying, oh, it's frustrating that I don't have it. You can just say, gee, you know, we do this thing a lot. If there was a connection, it'd be great. And you can just add it to the list. You know, yeah. it can go on and you'll get to it when you get to it. Yeah. I mean, we, 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 our devs pretty quick. Um, so, so, you know, uh, we're able to upgrade and, and add in things pretty quickly. What we don't want to do is build a customizable service. Right. Um, uh, for a very good reason, because customization is the enemy of integrations. Right. Right. Hence, hence yep. X plan has a problem. So, so, yeah. So we want to, we, we have a configurable service rather than customizable service. There are a couple of customizations on it. The scope of advice questions can be customizable, but they're hard coded. Okay. A- and the risk profile that we use, we have a built in okay. risk profile tool, but if you want to use your own one, then we can hard code that in as well. Yeah. Uh, but everything else is configurable. And we mean, what we mean by this, you can turn on or off sections. Okay. And template those. So if you've got a template, say, say you're a risk specialist and just do, do risk, then you probably turn off the risk profile tool. You might turn off expenses. You might turn off entities. You know, you might just leave on the sections that you want to turn on. And so awesome. some awesome. advisors start off with a very small fact find. Yep. They turn a lot of stuff off and then they gradually turn stuff back on to encourage clients to use a bit more. You know, yeah, it depends, okay. on what the, depends on the sort of interaction you want to have with the client. Right, and, and what that experience, well, how they want to run that. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's that's helpful because it's not this, here is this 427-page thing. Uh, it's down to what you think works for the way you're running your experience. Yeah, you know? and like, and, like most uh, things, fact finds can be completed in you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes if you, if you want to, if it's simple. Yeah. If it's not simple, it can take a couple of hours or, or even a couple of days yeah. when you get the information together. But um, but but it's it just it's, it's designed to be as flexible as possible for the users. So, so we've got some some users who um, who primarily use the mini fact find yep. and use and use the fact find themselves to store information. They've got other, okay. other users who who exclusively send the fact find to clients and get them to fill everything in and come back to me when you're finished. Others use a hybrid. Some don't use it at all for the, for the clients. They just use it in in house to. to store their information so it's yeah okay we, we know that all people roll different ways what we don't want to do is is go down the path because at, to a certain extent at, our profession is hamstrung a bit because everyone wants to do it their way yeah you know i mean i've been yeah. about standards for a long time but yeah but, you know when everyone wants to do it everything their way <laughs> Yeah, and we're going to be hamstrung with technology. You know, it, it's you've got to be able to say, you know what, that's pretty good. I can see where they've gone there, and right, you know, I'll modify, I'll, I'll modify myself a little bit to it. Rather that's than, the thing, and also, well, what else did what I do is an, you know, an addendum to that that'll get me the result I want. You know, so I agree. I do think um, it's interesting. It is hard because personalization we feel like is what makes it unique to us. Where in truth. It's the experience itself that is unique and the way that you intro it, the way you really like what happens after, what happens below, you know, all those sort of things. And even the way the language you use to describe it and and the positioning, all of that is what's yeah. unique. I mean, clients, um, can't, clients can't see personalization. No. They've, got no, they've got no point of comparison. No. You know, so, so <laughs> we talk about it all the time, but clients have no point of comparison between personal A and personalization B. It, it just doesn't no. exist. So, no, so we've, tried, we've tried to – what we've, I guess, found is, is – uh, I say iFact Finds a consensus software tool because so many people have given us feedback over the years that we've modified, amended, updated, added in based on feedback from users that it becomes yep. really a consensus tool. And, and um, you know, if you want something that's very different, well, you have to use something else. <laughs> but, yeah. but, but your choices are limited. There's only a few of us around doing a real interactive uh, sort of SaaS-based um, tool that, that's not just um, – you know, like a, a you know, like a, a sur- sur- survey monkey or, or cognitive form. That's just a one-off thing. Yeah, you can't go back to that and fill it in. You know, it's hard to go back and fill it in later on. So it's you fill it in or don't fill it in. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I've put it. You know, my background's behavioral finance, and I've put there's some good behavioral finance tools in there. So the the goals tool is behaviorally based. Okay. Um, you know, as far as being, you know, showing sort of multi goals or showing a goals menu. Yep. Um, rather than saying, what are your goals? And clients say, I don't know. We show <laughs> them, Here's, here are the 16 primary goal areas. So, yep. including health. You know, what do you mean by health? Well, do you need dental work done or, or having an operation coming up? Oh, yeah, I am. It's going to cost me 20 grand for dental work. Okay, great. Let's, that's a goal. It's a future yep. expense. So, so, we're just trying to capture as much as we can. Um, so, the clients have a sense that. Um, I really know them. You know the old know yeah. your client rule. We've kind of forgotten a bit. You know, it's it's um, you know, it, but it's it's really really important. And the clients have to have a sense that we really are taking the time to get to know them as best as we possibly can. 
Yeah, and I think um, one of the other things when you use something that gives you structure, right? So a fact find tool that gives that gives structure is it frees you to dive deeper. That's what I love about those things. So we can, yeah, the basics. Yep, good, good, good. Oh, that's interesting. Why was blah right? So it lets you focus as the advisor on the next level of depth, not having to go. Oh, I didn't ask them about the mortgage repayment frequency, or is it? Do you know what I mean? Like it? Yep, I totally. think it frees your there. brain out for the yep. depth, uh, and that's where the real value is. You know, in terms of the interaction. So well, I think, that's I think what I like also, about you structure. Also make, you can also make some points. You know, like we in our state planning section, we ask. You know, when when was the will completed? What year? And then we ask, where is it located? Where is it physically located? Okay. Now, I would say, in my experience, at least half of people who filled in go, I don't know. I've got a copy at home. No, 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 not the copy. Where's the original? Yeah, okay. Right, because the copy doesn't copy doesn't work anything. Where, where's the original? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Or it's with, oh, I don't know. You know, yeah, because it was done ten years ago, twelve years ago. So it makes a point. Yeah, you know that that's what we're here to talk about. That I'm not going to do the will, but unless you speak to me, no one would have spoken to me about that. Yeah. So you know that's that's the role that we play. You know, is that important? And it is. I mean, things fall apart in the minutia, don't they? Or in the administration? You know, it's like, yeah, we've got one. Oh, oh, well, don't know where that is. No. <laughs> like, so I haven't oh, got one. That yeah, correct? Like, yeah. there's not much point. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually. Yeah. Um. So in terms of your current users. What are the ninja users doing? Like, has anybody done something you're like, wow, I didn't expect you'd use it that way? Like, is there anything like that that you're seeing in terms of the experienced users? I mean, certainly certainly the experienced users who are users who like to have clients modeled before they see them. Right. So they're taking the data from Minifact Find, putting into some basic modeling, whether it's Tools Plus or Voyant or whatever they're using, and creating some basic models. So when the clients come in, they're read, they're on the screen. Okay. Uh, and so they're able to say, hey, okay, here's what you told me. Yeah. Um, here's where you're going to finish up. Here's the shortfalls we need to talk about. Okay. You know, and, and that helps, so, helps to go through the scope then. So that's sort of that on the path you're on, this is where you're at. Yeah. You know, and then, yeah, okay. So it's and almost a baseline. Doing a little gap analysis because when yeah. you know in, in the financial planning process, all those are seven steps now, scope starts, it's starting a scope. But where are you now? You know, where do you want to be? What are you doing about it? Well, yeah. We've got those three pieces of information. And so with those three pieces of information, we can create a basic model. Yep. That says here's where you're at, you know. Yeah. Others are using, you know, we have a review process built in. So we've got a mm-hmm. review workflow built in. So you can for every client, you can put a um, you know, a review, review, review date, review frequency, and then how many days you send out. They they get a link to to log into the fact find to update the fact find and, and get it done. Okay. Um, people are using that pretty well. I know that sometimes is a little bit conflicted with other workflows around reviews. Right. All right. Because sometimes I've got a review workflow that works differently, but but we have a um, we have a white label client login link for every practice, yep. so they can take that and embed that into their other workflow. So when okay. they get when the review comes up, hey, click on the link and go into the white fact. Go and do that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So we're probably our, our others. Our file notes system. There's a lot of advisors starting to use audio recordings of meetings, mm-hmm. and so our file notes can accept audio recordings. Okay. Uh, as an attachment. Okay. Um, so it's pretty pretty useful. Mm, um, absolutely. Yeah. So I think that's uh, you know that that's some of the real tips that people people are using. But but the, perfect. But it's it's going it's going well. How about um? So you talked about the the client interface changing and updating. What prompted that? Was that just was that actual client feedback or was that advisor feedback? Both. I mean, it was it's okay. the same it's the same upgrade. So there's the remember the client and the advisor see exactly the same thing. Mm. But we knew we knew it had become a little bit clunky to move from you know say adding in a child. When you yeah. add the child and click save, you go back to add another child, click the button again, add a child, go through that process again. Yeah. So we figured we can take those three buttons away with one button. This is add another child. Yeah. Right? Um, you know, so so little things like that. We also we know in every section there's compulsory and optional information. And we kind of we kind of embedded the optional and compulsory throughout the page. So what we've done now is take all the compulsory questions, those two or three key compulsory questions, Big and ones, put them yeah. at the top. Okay. And then say, tell me more. Yeah, and so the clients can see there's less information has to be filled in rather than trying to think they've got to fill it all in, which you want to fill in, but but they can they can get through it quicker. And I do think, I mean, that's a behavioural thing too. Um, you know, nothing frustrates me more than when we get these. Um, you know, maybe it's a research questionnaire or whatever. Oh, it'll only take you a few mi- minutes, and then as you go through, there's 427 questions, and you're not. Do I have to do all this? Is there not yeah. some shorter version? I was willing to spend the time, but you know. <laughs> So to make that clear, I think is really important because at least you'll get that, you know, at least the client can get that far. 
Yeah, it's just it's enough information. You know, things like a turn deposit. We, we need who's it with, how much is with, when is it mature, and what's the interest rate? But what's the interest frequency? All those other questions. They they're, they're kind of nice to know. Yeah, uh, but not need to know. So we just think that'll that'll drop um, a lot of. What we're trying to do is constantly remove barriers to completion. The friction. Yeah, you know, trying to remove the friction as much as we can. I mean, that's a constant process of doing that. And there's lots of little things that we do that that constantly make that make that better because it is a, it is a big document. Mm. You know, there's a lot to complete in the fact in a fact find. You know, we get some yeah. some uh, dealer groups have come to us. Well, our fact find is currently 55 pages long. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, ours is pretty conditional. So if you yeah. say no, the rest stops. So we move to the next question. Yeah. You know, it's it's sort of that. Yeah. That's how it gets to it. So we can we can ask 55 pages worth of questions, but but not not have them have it look like it's 55 pages. And yeah, and, definitely. Uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's horrible for us to contemplate, let alone the book client. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Um. And so, in terms of in terms of looking forward, you know, you mentioned a few things you've got on the development post. Is there anything else that's maybe a "ooh, I'd love to"? Like, is there one of those things out there that "oh, I'd love to get to the point where we can do this"? Look, if I, you know, just between you and me, Peter, but um, <laughs> but we are we are building out probably in in the second half of next year. We want to build out calculated functionality that will okay. auto populate. So we want to be able to get to a gap analysis. Yes. Once you've finished the fact find, you automatically have a gap analysis done. Yeah. You know, so we know what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, we, we know if we look at the steps, we, we're just mindful of, you know, we're a bit careful. We don't want to step on too many toes. Yep. <laughs> you know, we you know we know that our software sits under the stack. Yep. You know, it's a foundation piece of the stack. Um, yep. Uh, and so we want to be integrating. We don't, I don't want to, we don't want to sort of take all the other functionality from other software. So we, we just want to become the best fact finder we can. But with what we can do with the fact find is we know we've got, where, where are you now? Where do you want to get to? And what are you doing about it? That is the gap analysis, right? And, and yeah. so we've got the goal setting, we've got the scope, we've got the gap analysis. What you want to do past there as an advisor, you further modelling, go from there. And the thing is, I mean, it's it's. What I find it really interesting actually in terms of modelling my background, which I may not have shared actually on the podcast yet, is is um, I studied actuarial studies and I worked in investment banking. And so, you know, Excel, macro, you know, like we were just modelling up the wazoo, right? Mm. And when I reflect on what we end up trying to do with clients – I don't think we we use back of the envelope sort of calculators enough. Like I just don't, like there's that. Hey, that's your super balance, and that's the amount going into your super right now. That is that's going to be about this amount, and that's about two thirds of what your average Australian needs. You know that's that what, sort that's of what stuff. That's what we want to get to. That we're, we're yeah. building in the, the numbers as we go. So in the insurance needs analysis, for example, in, which we call a goal insurance goals, mm-hmm. uh, we'll be pre-populating numbers. So you'll yep. see what the dollar values are for the different factors that you want to incorporate. So that's what we want to get to is is that that um, piece. It is it is back of the envelope stuff, but it's yeah. it's, it's just that we we can get too complicated. You know, we get oh. too focused on things like uh, stochastic analysis, and we all get excited about that. But in reality, an advisor shouldn't need stochastic analysis because you know I was talking to a pilot one day who said to me, you know what, if we were taking up from Melbourne to Sydney and we did didn't do anything, we'd probably finish up in Hong Kong. Right. Okay. Because what I'm doing is con- what the plane's constantly doing is constantly making little adjustments to make sure it keeps yeah. on track. Yeah. So the stochastic analysis assumes that you don't ever touch it. You right. just get what you get and here's the range that you can get. But if I'm yeah. making little adjustments by adjusting as I go, yeah. I'm going to get closer to where I want to get to. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so it's less important to make that really whiz bang functionality as opposed to a back of the envelope stuff that's all when you get to here and you're not going to get there. So we need to make some changes. Well, and I remember um, there was a, a guy I worked with back in my investment banking days who um, who used to say the word assumptions, ass umptions. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason he did was because yeah. you have one assumption, okay, your, your likelihood of getting it right is not bad, but we all know we have – uh, up multi, like 30, 40, like it's the m- amount of num- when we do those numbers, the amount of assumptions and we're layering them on top of each other. So actually we're making, we're implying certainty, but in fact we're delivering less certain the more assumptions we use. And that's the thing I think is that always worries me about modelling is I think actually a back of the envelope that gives them a feel, are you vaguely on the right track and let's just – Guardrails, love guardrails. You know, like here's some guardrails. If we can try and keep it within this and this, yay. You know, uh, because you know you only, you know, particularly with compounding, you only need to tweak something one way or the other, and the numbers are ludicrous. Um, you know, and the timeframes we're talking are long. You know, we're not talking next year. Correct, and also, also the answer to everything is it, pe- it depends, right? That's the yes. answer to everything. So, yes. so what advisors have to do is understand they've got a series of levers they can pull. And what are the consequences of pulling those levers? Yeah. Right, am I going to get closer 
or further away from where you want to get to. Yeah. Okay. That's what it comes yeah. down to. And that's the that's the art of financial planning. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. and that's what we, we we're trying to make it scientific. And it is scientific to a degree, but we try, but it is the art. It's about understanding that, okay, well, you know what, you you've you got a big mortgage and really to get the mortgage down to this level is really important. Not to get it gone, mm. but to get down to this level. That's what we'll focus on first. When it's there, we'll start to focus on this over here. Yeah. You know? Um yeah, that's absolutely. the art of it, so. absolutely. So is there anything have we missed anything? I feel like we've covered lots of areas. Mm. Is there any any elements we've missed? I mean look for, from a pricing point of view, yep. Um, we, we've priced I, I fact find at the very low end. We're, we're not. We think it's. I mean, there's others who argue, of course, but we think it's the best <laughs> digital fact find. Yeah, uh, it's the most comprehensive. It's the most user friendly. It's 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 uh, integrates with other software. But we clearly, from day one, understand understood. It sits as as the foundation of the tech stack. It's not the tech stack. Yeah. So we're not trying to price it. So we charge only. Advisors, you know, only people mm-hmm. who pay are people on on the on the advisor register. All support mm-hmm. staff don't pay. Um, we include external power plans in that. If you use external power plans, they can have free access to it. There's no charge yep. on a per client basis, so you have unlimited clients. And the cost is for the full integration versions uh, under 170 bucks a month. Okay. Um, for, for for unlimited use, you know, yeah. for advisors. So that's with the full integration version. The non-integration yeah. version is cheaper than that. So yeah, but we're not okay. we're not we're not at that higher level of cost um, on purpose. Because you know, I'm yeah. a practitioner and I know how much software costs. So, right. so you know, we've, we've tried to factor in. And I think, you know, there is an accessibility issue with with technology generally inside our industry versus outside, you know, and there's all these great tools outside the industry that are about whether it's marketing or all these sort of things. I can give it a whirl, you know, like it's that I'm just going to give it a whirl for a while. But when we when the pricing becomes really high, you can't even give it a whirl. No. It's an all in thing, no. you know, and, and I, I just don't think that's the way a lot of tech's gonna work in the future. I just think we're gonna because something will be perfect, but we've got to try it first, you know, and just give it a bit of a you know, a bit of a try, start, oh wow, this is fantastic, off we go. Um, whereas when it's a lot, well then you're investing a lot of time and energy into that too, you know, and it's it's the cost just builds, doesn't it? Like it's yeah. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna find a balance because it is it is software that needs um training. Mm. You know, it's like a lot of software needs needs training and when you're charging virtually nothing, you can't afford to train, you know, yep. <laughs> a lot. Yep. Um and our bread and butter is coming from one and two person practices, so they're not they're not big buyers. Um we're still gonna train them just the same. Yep. So we still do train them. But it's it's just that balance, isn't it, between between to the cost for us, cost for you, yep. um, you know, how, how it all comes together. So we'll try we'll try to find that find that point. And I think um, the thing that we probably need to acknowledge in the advice industry, look, I, you know, talk a decade or more ago and and I think we probably expected something to get delivered to us and it would be this wonderful machine and and I just turn up and plug it in and off we go. Um, whereas these days to me the single most powerful thing you can do before engaging with a provider for whatever tech it is, is just know what your process is, like really deeply understand your process and what you want your experience to be. Cause then even in training, you can ask very specific questions. Like it's, it lets you get from zero to a hundred really quickly. Um, whereas I find people struggle to get to onboard when they don't really know their own process already yeah. well yeah. enough. I think, I think, although they need to be a bit flexible with that, they need to say, yep. okay, well, I, this software is great. Um, but it doesn't, you know, I, I, I find it frustrating if people say it doesn't match my, my workflow exactly. Right. No, there is nothing out there that matches your workflow no, exactly. So therefore, it's your workflow. <laughs> stop looking. Stick yeah. with what you've got. Yeah. Uh, but if you're happy to sort of tweak a little bit and yeah. so if you just tweak this little thing, you get this all this efficiency and all this yeah. effectiveness comes out. So. And particularly, I think um, more and more. Well, now with everything that we use in the pre- in our business and and look at, it's what. What does this mean for the user experience being yeah. the, the consumer? Correct. Um, and if that makes it a little harder on us, but a lot better for them, I'm in. You know, like it's like that's how it should work, you know. And and so, so, and if it means we do, you know, B before A now, because, well, actually, that just makes makes it all smoother and it, it's easier for them. Yay. You know, yeah, let's do that. Totally. I mean, we, we get, look, the, the document vault is really what the clients, one of the things the clients love. We, we've got clients who, our clients who, who travel, have put their travel documents in. They've put their right. travel insurance documents in because they know they can access it any, anywhere in the world. So it's, yeah. So little things like that is a little thing. We didn't think, we didn't intend to put anticipate that value adds, but yeah. there it is, you know, it's just stuff like that. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
All righty. Well, all right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about iFactFind, then the website link is going to be in the episode show notes, along with Paul's LinkedIn details. So feel free to hit him up on LinkedIn um, and ask all sorts of questions and, and uh, you know, see what, what you can find and what will work for you. Ah, thank you so much uh, for joining us, Paul. I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, other sort of client interactivity and other features you guys come up with in the yeah. future. So, right. Thank you, you know, really best of it. luck. Really enjoyed Oh, good. It. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Peter. So, are you a current user of iFactFind? Do you agree or sort of disagree with our sort of discussion of the app or the concept even of digital fact finds? Please, please, please share any insights you have or your experience on the XY community platform. I'd love to hear your take. Um, We've been looking into something like this for some time, so I'd love to get your feedback um, and I'm sure all of the listeners would um, love any further tips you have uh, for advisors considering something like iFactFind. In terms of my thoughts, I think uh, there's a, you know, a section of us who probably resist some of these tools because we really worry about it, you know, outsourcing stuff to the client. You know, is that really the experience we want? Which I really understand. You know, I think it can be easy and just like Paul was saying, it can be easy just to shove it off to them and go, well, at least that makes me more efficient, not really considering what then the client's experience is. But I think if we go back to the beginning and realize we are going to have to collect information from the client, right? That I mean, that's necessary um, and somewhat torturous, no matter which way you do it, then, you know, a lot of this, I think, can be a wonderful hybrid experience, you know, so give them the maybe the opportunity to do that, you know, a mini fact fund at the beginning, give you a bit of information, maybe then have a video personalized from each advisor. So it can just be one per advisor in your team that talks them through how important, you know, up to date and accurate information is, maybe gives them a to do list of the sort of things you're going to need as they complete the fact find um, and where to find that, you know, some people don't even realize where they can find that information out. So maybe giving them some help and some instructions, it could be a downloadable or it could be on the video, and even set their expectations of the sort of time this will take. Um, you know, oh, look, if you sit down, it'll probably be about 15 minutes. But hey, if you do it over a couple of times, you know, two or three times, and you'll get it all done. So really, just set that expectation. And the best way to do that is to have you and your entire team put your own information into these tools when you're trying them out, right? So that's the way to get that feel is really consider yourself like the consumer, get maybe your partner to do it or something so that you can almost watch them as they're completing, understand where the barriers are and and be preemptive about how or proactive about the way that you address those. Now, um, you know, I mean, it sounds great that there's constantly, if they're struggling, hey, they can reach out to the advisor or they can flag it. That's fantastic. But to be honest, this whole thing is all about positioning. Top and tail these experiences, whether it's with video, whether it's with a follow-up email, a follow-up phone call from the team, whatever you do, you know, we've got to help the clients understand that the numbers are just data. What we're doing is just getting some data so that, you know, and doing that beforehand means we can spend time in the meeting, meeting really digging into their hopes for the future, what drives them, what, you know, what they're looking forward to, what they're fearful of, you know, the real juicy stuff, right? So what we're doing is separating those two things and using the numbers just as a sort of bouncing off point for that conversation. Um, and, you know, it's something else we can get in the habit of doing is thanking them for the time to do that. Thank you so much for doing that. That's fantastic, right? So this is all about positioning and interjecting your energy and, and your approach to this experience into a tool like, say, I fact find. Um, they're all just tools, right? These apps are just tools. The experience all comes down to the way we choose to implement them. Um, and that's where we need to give it some great thought. Now, ooh, it's curiosity corner time. So as we all know, only one skill you need to become a bionic advisor, and that's avid curiosity, right? Always wondering, hmm, what could do that? Why does it do that, right? So today we're actually going to challenge the way or the why we use spreadsheets. So today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is Airtable. You can find it at Airtable.com. Uh, their tagline is, is connect everything, achieve anything, right? Hmm Challenge. Uh, so Airtable is actually a sort of low or no code tool or platform for building collaborative apps for your team. 
It could customize a workflow, help you collaborate on a particular topic or issue, um, and it's all with a really easy to use and intuitive intuitive interface. So for example, uh, you might currently use a spreadsheet, say, for your client work pipeline or maybe your new business pipeline or lead pipeline. Spreadsheets, you know, seemingly great for this type of thing. I mean, it seems natural. They've got rows and columns and data, you know, that you can then use formulas to calculate values. It's easy to follow, you know, and and scroll your eye down. Um, And to be frank, given the financial nature of the work we do, then spreadsheets often feel really intuitive to us. So, well, of course, I'd put that in a spreadsheet. However, the thing that spreadsheets are not is a database. You see, a relational database doesn't just store data, right? It's not just fields that has data in it. It stores relationships between that data. Linking, for example, all the clients at a certain stage in your process or all the clients looked after by a specific advisor. You can then use those relationships to answer any operational questions you have. Um, Storing sort of related data together in a single spreadsheet can get really unwieldy and it can actually invite errors um, when you try to sort it and compare it and things are hidden or they're not hitting. It, it can become a bit of a d- disaster. But with a database, for example, you could easily reorganize the table to give a view for just one advisor. It doesn't change the underlying data. It's just the viewpoint um, that changes, uh, you know, without modifying the database itself. And this is where Airtable gets really clever. They have grid views. They have form views, so you can just enter data easily. They even have calendar views, so you could actually see certain the certain entries due date on an actual calendar. So you might have your database about that pipeline and then you use the calendar view to see the workload going out. Oh, we've got three on that day and two on that day and four on that day, right? They also have a gallery view that represents your records as large cards. Now, if you're using Trello, which is a bit similar in that respect, then but you might be finding you're sort of really stretching the limits of what's possible there, then you might want to give Airtable a look as a relational database. They've got loads of templates to get you started and heaps of videos and training. And there's all sorts of people that talk about using Airtable and are experts in it. Um, And as if it couldn't get any more awesome, it also integrates with Zapier, which we were talking about earlier in the episode. So you could have data added based on something that occurs in another app and it could get added in that database. So this is one of those tools that's incredibly powerful Um, And it can really bridge the divide between the sort of nerdy spreadsheet analysts in your team, and I put myself in that sort of category, and those simply needing to reference data to do their jobs, where it's really quite functional. I just need to understand what, you know, this thing for this client or this thing for this stage or this thing for this process. So definitely check it out. If you do end up giving it a try, please post or post on social or DM me what you come up with as I'd love to hear what you end up using it for and, you know, how creative you got. Because that's really what this comes down to too, is it's the creativity and the way you can look at things differently to take advantage of a tool like Airtable. Um, Spreadsheets are a really great example of tools, you know, we've stretched beyond their intended use. Um, So, you know, with such easy to use alternatives of Available these days, honestly, you're going to be stunned at how easy things can become. So get on it, folks, and just give something like this a whirl. Well, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event to brief your audience on the seven habits of bionic advisors and hand over the secrets to tech-powered, human-centric advice, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn at PeterMD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.